Shari. Hi, I'm here. It's, oh, you got the slides already up. Thank you. Yes, so I'll control the slides. You just let me know when to move forward. Welcome, okay. Shari. Next slide. So let me introduce myself. My name is Sherry Curtis and I am the manager for Prince George's County Health Connect, a program of the Department of uh, Social Services. And what we do at Prince George's County Health Connect is focus on education and outreach and enrolling Mar Maryland residents into health coverage through Maryland Health Connection. And our motto has always been and will be get covered, get seen, get healthy. Our mission is not only to give people access to health coverage, but to encourage them to use it and to work on achieving their maximal level of health. Next slide. So I'm briefly just gonna go over what Maryland Health Connection does, a little bit about how we are here to help and some news about 2021. Next slide. So Prince George's County Health Connect is a program of the Department of Social Services, like I said, and we have several partners. And these are our partners right now that we work with that have navigators that support getting people enrolled into health insurance. The health department, of course, is a key partner for us, the Healthcare Alliance. We are CASA, which handles a lot of our communities that have limited English proficiency. We have navigators training at Community Clinic Health and Wellness and HCD International not only provides navigation services, but they also do our graphic design and prepare our beautiful collateral in many languages that we distribute across the county. Mary Center hosts our navigators that are located in DSS sites, and um, they've been a partner since the very beginning. SEED is a small operation over in Riverdale where we have a lot of uninsured residents in that community. And the Primary Care Coalition of Montgomery County manages our program measures, our data analysis, and helps us with our learning collaborative meetings. Next slide. I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly. It's a lot of information, but I thought that what I would do is, um... sorry about that. Um, what I would do is just kind of take you through some of the basics. So next slide. Um, wait a minute, did we miss one? Yeah, go ahead. So one of the things I wanted to share, do the previous slide for me, I'm sorry, I, I moved too fast. Thank you. One of the things I wanted to share is just talk a little bit about the uninsured because I know a lot of the people on the line are concerned about how many people are uninsured. We started this program in 2010 and we estimate that there's about 100,000 Prince Georgians that still lack health coverage. Um, at the end of 2019, and that was before coronavirus. So since then, we know that many more have been without health insurance. Um, a lot of it because of our uh, job loss in the county and people losing their employer coverage. About 60,000 of this 100,000 though are not eligible due to their immigration status. So that means that we still have 45,000 residents that could be eligible that would be able to access health coverage and a lot of them would be eligible for Medicaid. Next slide. So what Maryland did was in their um, effort to try to help people focus on staying insured when the Trump administration got rid of the, the rule where people would be penalized for not being insured, Maryland put um, a, an easy enrollment program together for residents that when they submit their state tax, if they check the box that they don't have health insurance, then our navigators are reaching out to them. We get the list from the comptroller's office and we're calling people that have expressed an interest in having health insurance. And currently the program is going really well. Next slide. So I know that some of you have been hearing about the American Rescue Act, which is also called the COVID relief bill. And it's actually achieving some significant savings for health insurance and putting a lot more people into Medicaid that otherwise would not have met the threshold for their income. 
um, they've changed some of the formulas and the rules. And if a person has received any unemployment in the last year, their um, FPL drops to 139%. So some people actually have been getting um, premiums as low as a dollar 65 cents mark you know it's been really interesting watching how these formulas are taking place it went into effect april 1st and already we've had hundreds of families in prince george's county come in to um, reassess their premium costs and many of them have ended up becoming eligible for medicaid next slide so these are the, the, the tracks that we follow for Prince George's County residents. There's a few ways to access the, the health insurance. Many residents are eligible for Medicaid or the Maryland Children's Health Program that covers children under the age of 18. And for those who don't qualify for Medicaid, some residents are eligible for private health insurance and our navigators have a way of connecting people to those resources. Next slide. So let's just talk a little bit about Medicaid because Medicaid is basically a health benefit for low income populations. We actually enroll people in Medicaid year round. The Affordable Care Act defines two populations under Medicaid, either MAGI or non-MAGI. And that always confuses a lot of people who aren't doing this every day in their work. So income and resources are the guidelines used to determine who qualifies and how to apply for or renew Medicaid. Um, and that is the MAGI household. Um, and we have to make a decision when we interview people what, what they're designated for MAGI or now non-MAGI. Next slide. So there are some people who are automatically eligible for Medicaid. Um, SSI recipients, people that receive cash assistance, children in foster care, and the justice involved youth in the system used to be called juvenile delinquents, but I think you understand who I mean. Um, they don't need to apply for Medicaid separately because it's a receipt of the benefit or the service that they're already getting. Next slide. When the Affordable Care Act was passed, it expanded Medicaid, which which changed the eligibility thresholds for many residents, which has now changed again. And so people who are MAGI eligible, um, these are the components. I don't wanna read everything because you all can read, but we, we wanted to get rid of the resource limits. They are implementing new application and renewal procedures and it covers non-disabled adults from 19 through 64 who do not have dependent children. So these would be um, people who are eligible for services. Next slide. So the MAGI population is as followed. Pregnant women, dependent children under 19, parents and caretakers and relatives of children under 19, applicants 65 and over, as well as applicants with Medicare are typically budgeted as non-MAGI. And so we do serve people from 19 to 64 and put them in regular Medicaid, but people who fall outside of those parameters are usually designated as non-MAGI. The non-MAGI population is typically served by the Department of Social Services um, and the MAGI population is primarily put into Maryland Health Connection. And these are the non-MAGI populations. So these would be the people that would fall into that category of non-MAGI and they still operate under eligibility guidelines, but they have uh, special circumstances where sometimes they have combined services where they have part Medicaid and part Medicare. And it's not as complicated as it sounds because the wonderful system does the calculations for you. So you are, um, able to work with a navigator or a case manager at DSS to get enrolled. So what I was asked to talk about, I wanted to give you some background, but what I was asked to talk about is how you actually enroll in Medicaid. Next slide. So Maryland's Health Choice Program, which is the umbrella 
healthcare services are provided through MCOs. And everybody knows that MCOs are managed care organizations and they must cover all of the following here on the list. And so there's a multiple things that MCOs must cover for people who are eligible for Medicaid and all of these services are at no cost to the consumer. The next slide talks about other Medicaid services and those are behavioral health services. A lot of people did not understand or know that under the ACA, um, behavioral health services were one of the 10 essential benefits and under Medicaid, all of these services are provided at no cost to the consumer. So when a person is actually ready to enroll, they need to have specific documents available so someone can enroll them quickly into the services that they're eligible for. So they need to have their photo ID, social security number or immigration status, papers and documents that would determine them lawfully present, um, pay stubs or some kind of tax statement if you're employed and policy numbers of other insurances if it's available. Some people have mixed households where some people in the household are Medicaid eligible and other people in the household actually are employed. And so all of the documents for the members who are gonna be considered in the Medicaid application need to be presented to the navigator so that they can assist them. Next slide. So when Maryland's can enroll in health coverage. So there's an open enrollment purely normally and a lot of people hear about it in the news, November 1st to December 15th. And that's the typical open enrollment period for people to enroll or browse to see what they're eligible for in health insurance. Of course, now it's been extended and extended and extended again due to the pandemic but Medicaid enrollment is year round. So there's no special enrollment period for Medicaid eligible residents. Some of the special enrollment periods are actually categorized as life events. So if somebody loses their job or gets married or divorced or moves to Maryland or their COBRA is ending, those kind of situations will allow a person to enroll as a special enrollment, even off the open enrollment times. A lot of times people don't know what they're eligible for. And we just encourage people to come in and find out. Um, because of this public health emergency, we've learned a lot and Prince George's County actually has enrolled the highest number of residents into the Maryland Health Connection Exchange than any other county in the state. Some people might think that that's good news, um, but we know that it's, actually related to the fact that a lot of people have experienced job loss and change of income. And so they've had to come in to see us. Um, the best part of this news is that our marketing efforts through the health department and through Department of Social Services and through our navigators and all of the partners in the community, we've been able to encourage residents to understand the importance of having coverage. And they've come in to us to make sure that they have coverage most of those 30 or 40,000 people that have enrolled since the pandemic have been eligible for Medicaid. Next slide. Let's see, I lost my space here. So basically we're here to help. I mean, all of our navigators, most of them are bilingual. We are available Monday through Friday and we can help residents from 18 to 64 become eligible. A lot of you already know that when a person turns 26, they're no longer eligible to be on their parents' insurance anymore. And we're finding that a lot of young people because they're working in the gig economy or they're in school part-time or working part-time, many of them are eligible for Medicaid when they leave their parents' insurance based on their income. no secret that all of our support actually is virtual. We do over, over the phone and online if the consumer 
um, is interested or willing, we can do virtual meetings with them to help them with their applications. And so that's how we're providing support right now. In our typical life, we're located in about seven different locations across the county. And we also have navigators that support other programs um, and accept referrals of people that come from other programs. So there's several ways to access Medicaid enrollment through Maryland Health Connection. People can do it you know, right on their computer from their desktop or laptop. They can use a tablet and you can download the mobile app and do it on the phone. It, they even provide an opportunity for you to um, take pictures of your documents and upload your documents. And all the sites are available in Spanish. And we offer probably 200 languages in the main um, Maryland health insurance marketplace for people who may not speak English as their first language. And this is how you reach us. I'm sure that Adeline is gonna share the slides. And so if anybody wants to talk to a navigator or refer anyone to a navigator, we're operating two call centers. Um, and then we also have a relationship with CASA, which is one of our partners. And they have a health, health, a health hotline in Spanish and a health hotline in French, which happens to be the third largest language in Prince George's County. That might be a new factoid that some people didn't know about. So I can take questions if anybody has any questions. Yes. So we do have a few questions. We wanted to save them till the end, or do you prefer now? Shari. I mean, if it's up to you, <laughs> however you want to do it. We can save them for the end. That way um, everyone else will get a chance to present and then we'll just go ahead and go through all the questions. And That's everyone, right. if you do have questions, feel free to add them to the um, chat box and then we'll go through at the um, after the presentations to review the questions. Thank you so much for that, Sherry. Yes. Yeah, sure. I, know I, I know I ran through it pretty fast, but people can go back and look at the slides, you know, over time. Thank you. Yeah, so be prepared, Sherry. We do have some questions for you, so. I'll, ha I'll hang out with you. Yes, thank you, Shari. Bye -bye. So up next, we're gonna have the MCO lightning round, and this is to share information on different programs and services offered at the managed care organizations. First, we will have Michelle Burton and Nicole Mariano from Amerigroup presenting. Hey, everybody, thanks for having me. All right, so I'll try to keep this as lightning as possible. Uh, so I'll try to go through it. So I'm a representative from Amerigroup, Group and Nicole is also here with me. Okay. You can go to the next slide. And we've been around since 1999. So one of the benefits that we're most proud of is our dental. So we offer up to $750 towards your dental, and that would include oral exams and cleanings twice a year, x-rays, extractions, and fillings. And then after that, you would have a 20% discount. And just like Sherry had gone over, here are the ways that you can apply and also renew your coverage. And I think what we have next is Another piece, which is our Aunt Bertha piece. I don't know if you were able to get that, Edeline. I, I can send that out to everyone, but I don't oh, have yeah, it on sure. the PowerPoint. Okay. Well, the other part was that we do have an Aunt Bertha link. If you go to Amerigroup Group Maryland, you can go to the community support link on one of the tabs. And then by clicking there, you just enter in your zip code and that will pull up dozens of community organizations that are vetted, that are open during this time of the pandemic that anybody can use. It doesn't matter if you're a member or not. And so we use that referral for our community partners and for the public to, to use at their convenience. And so those are the two pieces that we just wanted to highlight 
and I'm available if you have any other questions. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Michelle. So if anyone has questions for Michelle and Amerigroup, please drop them in the chat and we'll address them after all the presentations. So up next, we have Kelly Ray and Cinda Chase from Care First. Hi, thank you for um, allowing us to attend and inviting us. I just kind of wanted to go over the benefits. Um, basically, some of the value added benefits we have are adult dental, um, no copay for generic medications. We also cover adult vision, including glasses and contacts. Um, we also have an over the counter um, benefit, which is $15 every three months, which that also covers. Um, things like, um, you know, aspirin, you know, your, your typical regular medications, but we also have um, herbals included in that. We found that, um, you know, a lot of people are starting to switch over from man-made medications to herbal supplements um, and would rather, you know, take something natural. So we do include that in that benefit. Um, we also have benefit coordination. Um, you know, we cover doctor visits and wellness checkups. Another thing that we also cover is meals after a hospital stay. So this is done through our case managers. We find a lot of times when people come home from the hospital, um, you know, they may have a certain diet they need to follow. They may not have assistant at home, you know, someone to help, you know, cook those meals and things that they need. So we also cover that. And another thing that we offer too is um, acupuncture for substance abuse. We found when people are um, addicted to opioids and they are trying to recover, they, they respond really well with acupuncture. So that's also one of the things that we cover. Um, and then I know one of the questions were to highlight one of the things that we're most proud of. Um, you know, as you know, we are Care First Community Health Plan. Um, prior to that, we were in the community. We used to be University of Maryland Health Partners. So if someone's like, oh, they're new, we're not actually new. <laughs> we were purchased by Care First um, back in October and the name officially changed in February. Um, so all of our members did receive uh, written information, new handbooks, new cards and things um, like that regarding that. Um, the benefits all remain the same, you know, along with their doctors. Um, but one of the things that I really like the Care First does and has done, um, even prior to us coming aboard during like the pandemic, they actually supplied all the FQHC, QHCs with um, PPE. And that was done during, um, you know, the late summer, early fall. Um, each center in Maryland was supplied with almost $10,000 of PPE. So that could help the clinics and help the community as a whole, not just, you know, specifically our Care First members. And they are also doing a second round, um, which is taking place now, um, where they're going to send out more PPE to assist, you know, the different um, FQHCs, you know, with their needs, because a lot of times they do have limited funds. So this does, um, you know, assist with that program. So are there any questions? Well, I guess the questions will be at the end, but um, thank you guys again. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Cinda. That was a great overview. Next up, we'll have Zuma Chavez from the Maryland Physicians Care. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I am Zuma Chavez. Um, the Community Engagement Coordinator for Maryland Physicians Care. Um, I did notice where the slides were um, brought up. If you can please go back. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so just to give you a highlight um, on Maryland Physicians Care, it is a statewide local care managed care organization that has provided healthcare to um, health choice enrollees for 25 years. We were founded in 1996. Um, but here on the screen, um, you'll see that there are a few benefits services that we have, that Maryland Physicians Care covers. Um, now, one of the services that Maryland Physicians Care is most proud of, I would say would be telehealth service. Um, which is a, it's my virtual NPC is an application that our members can download straight to their um, smart cell phones. 
and they can video chat or either text with one of our physicians on call. So this is um, mainly used whenever one of our members uh, needs to either go to an emergency, um, an urgent care um, emergency room, but does not want to step outside their home or wherever they're at, um, they can video chat or either text message with a on-call physician. Um, usually our members, what we've seen is they've used it for um, uh, sick children, um, cough, fever, sore throats, or if they need to refill a prescription, ear aches, um, stomach pains, uh, just the mild pain um, that they can, uh, that they can video chat or, or speak with a physician and get medical advice. Um, it has been used mostly now, especially during the pandemic where people are not really feeling comfortable stepping outside of their um, homes. So, um, and then there is another gem. It's, a, it's a, a gem that Maryland Physicians Care likes to highlight, which is Pacify. It's also, um, it's a program offered to our uh, mommies, uh, pregnant members and new mommies that need assistance with um, breastfeeding. They can speak, virtually speak or chat with a lactation consultant. Um, they can also uh, speak directly with the nurse if they have any medical questions or case management. Um, and these flyers will be provided at the end of the um, of our video. If you can please go to the next slide. And um, here we also have just the uh, information on how our um, health companies can apply for medical assistance and see if you're eligible. I got it. That telemedicine piece is so critical right now. Yes, absolutely. Next uh, up, we have Kelly Watson with United Healthcare. Hello, everyone. I am Kelly Wilson with United you Healthcare. Um, we have. Hello? Can you yeah. all hear me? And also. Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear I'm you. sorry. I thought, okay. Um, so yeah, um, we have a number of uh, benefits and programs uh, for our members, but the one I'm highlighting today is our Healthy First Steps program. Um, it improves maternal health outcomes and help keep mom and baby healthy. Um, we identify and engage pregnant moms that are at high risk, and we encourage pregnancy education and healthy um, behaviors. Um, our Healthy First Step teams um, help our members schedule appointments and understand their health plan coverage. Members who enroll in a program can track appointments, receive reminder emails, and participate in the rewards program. Um, we also have a team of community health workers that are trained to engage members and perform health assessments. Um, education is provided on the importance of consistent prenatal care, we also identify barriers to care and help with finding a doctor, and we provide referrals to community-based organizations. So the slides that you're looking at today actually shows the different appointments in which those members can earn rewards. Um, and it also shows some of the examples of awards. And so I guess if anyone has any questions on this particular program or anything else with United Healthcare, um, I'll answer questions at the end. Thank you so much, Kelly. You're welcome. So now we'll move into our question and answer session. So Shari, so a question for you. So if someone calls Maryland Health Connection, can they request the navigator to help them or do they have to call the Prince George's County Health Connect? Whatever number they call, whether they call the 855 number at the state or the Prince George's County numbers, certified navigators are answering those phones. So they don't have to request a navigator, that's who's actually answering. Thank you. 
How do we assist incarcerated persons with this service? There is a program for the reentry people. So what the Maryland Department of Health at the state level has done is um, provided an opportunity for people who are in pre-release status or people who are preparing to re-enter to be eligible for the federal Medicaid program. And there is a division at the Department of Health uh, based out of 425 that actually supports that program. So they get referrals from the county incarceration system and then they work with those consumers to get them enrolled in Medicaid before they're released. There also is a program, the Bridges Center that was initiated by the health department. It's a collaboration with several agencies, a multi-service center. A lot of the people that they serve are people who are the re-entry population or just as involved population. And the health department supports enrollment for that group. All right, thank you. Can you expand on 425? You said out of 425, is that- well, 425 Bright Seat Road is the office where the health department is, is located right now, of course it's virtual, but that's the, um, that's the organization that's based out of that office that supports the reentry population. All right, thank you. So Shari again, you're very popular today. When a person is applying for Medicaid, can they have a core insurance, say maybe Cigna and have Medicaid as a secondary plan? Well, everything is based on income eligibility. And so there are mixed households where there's other insurances and that's why when we say what you need to enroll, if you have other insurances that gets factored in. But for the most part, what happens with most families is they'll either be eligible for one or the other. Um, and it really depends on the household makeup. So you may have um, one adult in the household that is receiving insurance through their job or some other private mechanism, maybe they weren't eligible for the exchange and then someone else in the household actually could be eligible for Medicaid. But it's a very rare situation where one individual has both. Okay, that's good to know. What is the program called where guardians over 65 on Medicare qualify for Medicaid if the children are under 19? Well, the person who is over 65 does not necessarily qualify for Medicaid. They would probably receive regular Medicare, but the youth is eligible for the Maryland Children's Health Insurance Program, finally known as MCHIP, which is run by the Department of Health. And so that would be the program for the, to have the child covered. They would be covered under MCHIP if they were under, under 19 years old. Okay, and is that also out of the Bright Seed Road location? It is, but you know, if they talk to a navigator, we, we have opportunities to make that person eligible. And we work with, very closely with the MCHIP program. So sometimes we hand off um, consumers to MCHIP to finalize the applications. Okay, thank you. So if a family has a child who's going off to college full-time, and having financial burden with paying for their college, can this child apply for Medicaid as a separate household or does the child still need to be covered by their parent until the age of 26? They could be emancipated and it's not required. You can be covered under your parents until you're 26, but many young people actually apply for Medicaid that are in college. We have several students from Bowie, from Prince George's Community College, that come to us to come off their parents. We've actually had some scenarios where the parents are like, I just can't afford to cover you at work anymore because it's like $400 a month. So if they terminate the, the child from their coverage, then the young person can actually apply on their own if they're over age 18. Okay. And in relation to this, I'm gonna jump in with this. So with the new relief plan that was just released, how does that affect this scenario? Does it have an impact on this scenario? It, it, it does not it does not. It just depends on how you apply. So if you're applying as an individual, all these new laws and new rules will apply to the person who's applying because it's built into the system already in terms of what 
what you would be eligible for. Um, and you can browse the system. I mean, there's anonymous browsing where you can go into MarylandHealthConnection.gov and you know put your situation in as an anonymous browser to get a handle on what you may or may not have to pay. So the American Rescue Plan definitely would assist in reducing someone's premium or their cost for care if they turned out not to be eligible for Medicaid. Okay, and I think I actually, I actually provided um, another document along with my slides, and it was it was issued in February, so it's fairly new. It's the MCO comparison chart. So hopefully, um, Adeline will send that out with the slides. But it basically shows all of the managed care organizations in the state of Maryland where they where their coverage areas are and there's only one out of all of them that doesn't cover Prince George's County everyone else does provide services in Prince George's County and what that sheet does is it kind of shows you what the different plans offer you know we're not allowed to suggest or steer any of our consumers to make their selections of their MCO so whether they're renewing or coming in new we provide them with the information about the MCOs and they choose their own MCO based on their their needs and their and and what is offered by the MCO. Okay. So we just take them to the we just take them to the water. <laughs> <laughs> and they drink yeah. on their own. <laughs> and I like the anonymous piece. I'm an advocate for private browsing. So mm. oh yeah and it's been it's been like that for a while but now since the new SCP and the ARPA, I gotta get used to another acronym now because American Rescue Plan Act is now called ARPA. And we actually have people that have already been calling our hotlines asking for ARPA. So um, it's, it's already trending. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm gonna give you a break right now. We're gonna jump to Zuma with some questions and we'll come back to you, Shari. So Zuma, how do people can have access to mental health through MPC, a large number of patients have been having difficulty getting connected with psychiatry. Okay, that's a good question. So uh, Maryland Physicians Care, any mental health services will not, um, uh, like psychiatrists or someone needs to see a psychologist, our members are usually redirected to public mental health. Um, Shari, I did notice where you um, had the telephone number up on one of the slides for the um, for mental health services, but that's that's exactly what we do. So anytime one of our members calls us, we just simply redirect them to public mental health for assistance with locating a psychiatrist, a psychologist, um, or just in general their benefits for mental health services. Okay, and is that how is that referral? Is it a smooth transition? Is there difficulty? How can patients, I guess, prepare for, pre prepare for that? So generally what we do is we give them the telephone number for public mental health, and then we'll transfer them over. Unfortunately, we cannot, we don't give referrals to a psychiatrist or psychologist. Um, they would have to call directly to the public mental health department. Okay, thank you. And does MPC offer home health care? Yes. It is, um, it is a benefit that is offered to our members. However, authorization, a prior authorization would have to be um, submitted by the member's provider um, with clinical notes, just uh, um, letting us know what the reason for the request is for home health. Okay. And going back to the mental health services, so does the client need a referral from their PCP or does it or the referral that they give when they call in, is that sufficient enough? That would be completely up to the, uh, the psychiatrist or the psychologist, the mental health provider that the member will be seeing. Um, so if they require a referral, then yes, that's something that they, the member would have to get from their primary care physician. If they don't, then that's, that's completely up to them. Okay. And do you help with that, with getting the, if it is required, if they do require a referral from the PCP, do you help with that, that facilitation or? No. Um, so Maryland Physicians Care in general, we don't require referrals to see a specialist um, and we don't give them out. So unfortunately it's, it's, it would be a little misleading if we try to facilitate 
Uh, we simply just advise, hey, if the specialist or the provider needs one, then you would just simply have to refer back to your primary care physician. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's good that you still provide them with that level of- We give them the information. Yeah. yeah. To, be able to help them walk them through the process. Thank you, Zuma. So now, Shari, we're back to you. <laughs> so why are some people auto-assigned to Medicaid every year and others must manually re-enroll? And how is that determined? Um, it's usually determined and driven by the consumer because there's a little box that you check in your application to be auto enrolled. So it's usually driven by the consumer. It's not automatic. Um, if nothing has changed in your life, nothing has changed in terms of your income or your family size, then you can opt for auto enrollment as, as much as three to five years out. Right now, the whole redetermination process is all up in arms because so many consumers have been extended so since March of 2020, anybody who was on Medicaid, their card did not expire. And so it's been, um, I think it's now September and it probably will end up going out until the end, end of the year. Okay, and a follow-up on auto, that. But auto okay. renewal. Go ahead, Jerry. No, I'm gonna say, you know, Auto renewal is something that the Maryland Health Connection is doing to, to really assist um, consumers, particularly since a lot of them can't go into the office to physically, you know, renew their applications. Yes, I know that was happening also with SNAP, where it was just continuing that their benefits. Um, do you know when that's ending? Or it's going to go through the pandemic? I mean, the just keep adding more months. So, you know, first it was March, then it was May, and now it's September 15th, and some are August, but, you know, CMS is kind of driving that train right now. And so we, Maryland has made a decision to follow whatever is coming out of the federal government in partnership. So we just, we just take the ride until they tell us to stop taking the ride but it's been um, all of our collateral and stuff now we don't even put a deadline date on anything because we're already printing stuff so we just leave it wide open and you know we'll let people know when it's going to close yeah okay. we just don't want a renewal nightmare you know we don't want them to end it and then have you know 28,000 residents trying to reach us to renew their Medicaid so what I'm hoping that they'll do, even though they haven't said it, but we suspect that what they'll do is it'll be based on the month that you were to expire. So even if you expired a year and a half ago, but your expiration date was like April 30th, then hopefully your renewal will trigger April 30th of 2022 if it goes through the rest of the year. I don't have those kind of answers. My pay grade is not high enough for that. Yes, but hopefully they do something along the lines what you said, so we don't have a renewal nightmare. And following up on the auto renewal. Well, the other thing is that even the, yeah, even the people that got way, way, way reduced coverage. I mean, we have people is that were paying as much as five hundred dollars, and now their new new premium is three dollars and twenty seven cents. And you know, because I try to live in the future, I'm just so afraid that they're going to create a cliff where people are not expecting to spend a certain amount of money. So people in Medicaid are in good shape because there's no out-of-pocket expenses and Shari, are you still there? I think she froze. <laughs> Oops. Um, wait, okay, she's coming back, she's coming back. Are you back, Shari? I think so. It says my internet connection is unstable. So I don't know how long you'll have me. Any more questions? Uh, there was a follow-up. How do they know, where's the, where can they click the auto enroll or how can they make check to make sure that they did click auto enroll on the application online? It's in their online app and review their application or they can call a navigator. The navigator, if they know their 
application ID or even their social, the navigator can look it up. And if they want to make that change, a navigator can do that right in their application. Okay. And lastly for you, where can people go to get assistance to file a Medicaid form, especially for those not comfort comfortable to file online? They should just call on the phone. There's no physical location right now to apply. Okay. So there are some special exceptions like people are, that are homeless or people, you know, that need an emergency card, but getting an appointment is very difficult and the I wouldn't even, the number is crazy. So if someone actually is uncomfortable with online, all they have to do is call us and the navigator will enroll them over the phone. And that's how most of the applications happen. You know, people that have a little bit of tech savvy going on really don't call us unless they get stuck or have a problem. Most of the people that call us are people that are either uncomfortable with the website or don't understand certain aspects of the electronic application. So navigators, you know, they do it all. Um, okay. Thank you. And one last, there's one more for you, Shari. Sylvia said that she is there. extremely difficult to get through the MD Health Connection line. And sometimes people have questions about their plan options and they want to speak with a broker. Can they contact you for assistance? Yes, because we have um, about 12 brokers that we work with directly. We put a shout out to all the brokers that serve Prince George's County and we invited them in for a conversation, we have Zoom meetings with them and we have sort of a, um, a resource list of brokers that we can connect people to, some who are bilingual and you know some who are not, and they can call us for that information. The 855 number for the state, you know, full disclosure has been difficult. I'm sure all the MCOs know that, you know, calling that state number is challenging for some consumers and you know having a local number where you can have a relationship with a navigator here in the county has been helpful to a lot of consumers particularly during this time so if somebody really has some challenges with their plan we have numbers of brokers that we can refer you to and i mean they call back immediately so it's not something where you'll get you know bounced around okay Thank you. It looks like they want to keep you in the game, Sherry. <laughs> Another question just came in. So if someone needs a service that their MCO does not cover, can this person call Maryland Health Connection to change their MCO? Is there a deadline to change? There is. I mean, all deadlines are just blurred right now with regard to that. But um, there is a time when it's time to renew their coverage if they want to change MCOs, they can. That's why the comparison chart is good because you can look at the different um, MCOs and what their coverage is. Um, but yes, and a navigator can assist with some of those questions, but we can't really make the selection for you. So if you call and you have a particular need, we can look at the comparison chart and say, well, this one and this one and this one covers that, this one doesn't. But, you know, they've leveled the playing field a lot and most of our MCOs offer quality services and most of them offer similar benefits. So there's not a lot of stark contrast between what somebody offers and what somebody doesn't offer. A lot of times people want to change their physician, um, you know, or get a different doctor or something like that when they renew. But um, we haven't had a lot of challenges with the MCOs, actually some offering one benefit and some not offering the other. Um, and I think the Maryland Insurance Administration who oversees you know, all of it, you know, has made it a point to make sure that people are offering comparable services. Right, good to know. But okay, so I wanna make sure I understand. So pre-COVID, AKA prehistoric times, they would usually have to wait until their renewal date in order to switch MCOs? Yes. Okay. Yes. I mean, there's an appeals process and there could be a, 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 a medical reason or something, you know, with regard to losing their provider or something like that. But, you know, those are special circumstances that would go through health choice. 
once a person actually has coverage, the navigator really doesn't do that much to support changing it unless you have a change. Okay, that's as a consumer enrollment. Okay, good to know. Right. So, but I mean, if you have an income change or a new, if you have an income change or a new baby or something that would require you to make a change, then through the change report, sometimes you can access a different MCO. But it's primarily during the time when you have to renew. Okay. And there's a question. So once you lock it in, you're stuck. <laughs> Pardon? Go ahead. Okay. No, you how had another you, question. How do you apply for Medicaid with no insurance? And how does it take, how long does it take to be approved? Because I believe you apply for Medicaid if you don't have insurance. Or if you need to change your insurance based on income. Okay. So Medicaid is available year round and the system will determine what you're eligible for. Um, so, I mean, that's how you enroll and you don't have to have insurance to enroll in, in in health insurance. Um, in fact, we're we're going hard after the people who are uninsured to see if we can assist them in bringing them into into health coverage. Um, so that that's not a challenge. Okay. And how long? What's the timeline for being approved? Now, is there a backlog of cases, or is it flowing approvals? Are approvals it's, flowing? It's really flowing unless somebody has a really complicated situation, and whatever time of the month because it's Medicaid like if you come in on the 16th of the month and you know you have a medical bill that you incurred on the 8th of the month there's retroactive coverage for that month so a person can get um, reimbursed and or the doctor can be reimbursed through Medicaid in that given month once they're determined eligible in in COVID times, you know, two to three weeks, maybe before they actually get their card. But once you're determined eligible and you select an MCO, you're really active at the date you become eligible, even if you don't have all of your documents yet, because when it goes into the system, if you select your MCO and, you know, it, it's pretty quick. I haven't seen anything take more than a month to six weeks. Thank you. Our last question will be for Zuma. Are there any stats on how many members utilize telehealth services? Sorry, I had to get myself off mute. Um, we definitely have that data. At this very moment, I do not. However, I can follow up with you to provide you with that information. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Michelle has her hand raised. Hey, I just had a question. I don't know if this is, um, I don't know, maybe like off the topic, but when folks enroll on the Maryland Health Connection website, is there also a box that they can check if they need information to enroll in SNAP? Hmm. Yeah. No. Do you think that could be something that um, could be added later on in the same way that we, you know, added on that that box when people enroll, I mean, when people submit their taxes that they need health insurance? Well, I mean, we're doing as much as we can in terms of partnerships, but the Department of Employment Services handles the food stamp, SNAP, and TANF program. If a consumer applies for that, you can get Medicaid. So it works the other way. You understand what I'm saying? If you come in for health insurance only, those other programs are not available through a navigator in Maryland Health Connection. But if you go to the Department of Social Services and you need more than one type of service, those case managers can, can help you with accessing the other programs. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I have a question, but we have three minutes, so I'll <laughs> let it sit, Sharon. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for your great question. Well, if somebody has you. another burning question, you can always, Adeline can email it to me and I can respond, you know, via email. Yes, and that goes for all of the other presenters. Thank you um, for the other MCOs, the representatives from the MCOs who came and presented today. If anyone here on the call has any questions, you can always direct them to, to me and then I will forward you and connect you with the respective party. Just some quick announcements as we wrap up. 
Just be on the lookout for some upcoming communication for our next quarterly coalition meeting. That's the meeting with all three work groups, our behavioral health advisory group, the Healthy Eating Active Living, and the Health Equity Work Group that will be on June 8th, 2021 at 6 p.m. So just look out um, for the flyers and just upcoming registration information for that. And also, um, don't forget to visit our website. We do have a new website. I will share that with you all with the um, notes, just the different resources. And if you all are interested, if you're not in the subcommittee and you're interested in attending any of our subcommittee meetings, we have a healthy food priority areas meeting on May 6th. The integrated health meets on Friday, this Friday um, at 11 a.m. And we have healthy food procurement on April 27th. And our food is medicine group meets on April 28th. And that is all. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, presenters. Have a great afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you so much. Everybody. You too. Thank you, Sherry. Yeah. Bye.